I, uh, how many monthly active users we need to power our data models. So those two things are absolutely critical, uh, bar none. Um, you know, I know you wanted to talk about fast channels, but yeah, what? One of the one of the things that's driving fast channels are fast channels as opposed to I'm going to load up a bunch of video on demand assets. A fast channel will drive more engagement, more ad views, more session and time spent than anything else. And we identified that in 2015 when we launched our our first channel at Calkins and. I spent three years evangelizing that, you know, a, a, a free ad supported streaming channel dwarfed anything that you could do with video on demand. But the challenge is it's hard. Even in 2023, it's hard. Welcome to the News Nirvana podcast. I'm your host, Nick Parker. The News Nirvana podcast features conversations with media professionals from across the country, highlighting our ever-evolving business models and showcasing the strong and effective journalism produced each and every day. This podcast is made possible to you by the generosity of Blox Digital. Blox Digital empowers content producers to connect with their worldwide audiences at scale and continuously transform to achieve their business goals. Contact Blox Digital today to learn more about how they can help you thrive and you can connect with them at BloxDigital.com. Hello and welcome back to the News Nirvana podcast. I'm your host, Nick Parker. With me today, I'm, I'm excited about this one, Guy Tasaka from Tasaka Digital. We're going we're gonna to get nerdy, Guy. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to do one of my favorite subjects, which is keeping up with technology and not fighting it like we used to in our industry. Uh, I also should mention that you are now a technology columnist for Editor and Publisher Magazine which I, th I I love what they're doing with that magazine. I, I really feel like it's kind of hitting the new stride that we haven't seen for a while. You're doing a great job. Um, well, so I, I'm going to, when we talked when we first met a, a few weeks ago uh, on, a, on a video call and you said something, you said, you said technology is our tool for embracing the future. So I, I just kind of, to me, that sets up everything because I feel like if you go back to the eighties and nineties, our industry fought technology hard. And I think a lot of the things that we're struggling with now could have been easier if we'd made some different decisions. Um, you know, if we'd, if we'd agreed in the late 90s, we, it was okay to charge for content. It would have fixed a lot of things or at least prevented some of the things that we're doing now. And I know that's oversimplifying, but, but I feel like we are an industry that didn't really embrace technology very well as it really started to boom. And now we're being forced to embrace that technology. And so I, I'm curious, as a as a guy who has you you've spent your entire professional life inside this bubble, like are are you seeing the industry embrace it? Is that is that really a thing? No, thank you, Nick. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity to to talk to your audience. But um, uh, this great segue. I just um, wrote a column for editor and publisher, and it talks about the different phases of technology and business strategy. And I broke the um, the history of local media into 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. And we're currently in 3.0. And we have to embrace a lot of different technologies that are very different than what came before. And to your That's point- That's not like being stuck in Windows 3.0, is it? It's <laughs> not 3.0. It's actually a good thing. Um, oh, okay. You know, as, 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 as we enter this uh, era of 3.0, which is, I, I use um, 2020 as kind of the- the, the, the starting point for 3.0, where strategies change, um, tech stacks change, but also um, the, um, we, we look back at 1.0 and 2.0 and what didn't, what worked in 1.0, what didn't work in 2.0, and we reassemble everything for 3.0. And, um, you know, it's, you, you, you talked about the paywall, you know, you talked about we should have charged back in 95. I don't know if people remember that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal were the first major websites. Mm -hmm. The Wall yeah. Street Journal from day one charged. The New York Times made it free ad supported. And the industry looked up and followed what the New York Times was doing rather than embrace what the journal was doing. So, you know, those two models were, were front and center and the industry could have made a choice. And, you know, they made the choice to go free ad supported. So it's really interesting, you know, how things have come full circle over 20 years. 
Yeah, and I think you know as we're we're shifting now to more paywalls, and and even I don't even know if you can always call them paywalls now. Like we're new ways because we've had to change how we view our audience, how we view our readers, our viewers, right? We and they are a part of the revenue stream now, more so than they ever have been. They are, and um, what's what's challenge the challenge of the industry is kind of I I, I don't want to call it innovators dilemma but now the industry's gotten so used to digital ad supported revenue from the website they're they're so used to digital subscription revenue from the website but those two things have both kind of hit their ceiling it's never combined they're never going to get us to where we need to be so the next well, and they're not thing, even getting us to where we were right exactly or where we need to be right considering the industry uh, the revenue for the industry is is you know 10% of what it was 20 years ago or 10 roughly 10% of what it was uh in in 2005 so i think um as we introduce 3.0 and what the strategy is going forward there we're going to have to give up some of what we gained in 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 the 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 previous era which was uh digital subscriptions so a lot of companies, you know, they're going out, they're getting digital subscriptions. You hit a ceiling and retention becomes your biggest problem. You're losing more than you're gaining, and then it becomes very expensive to try to maintain and grow. So uh, in, in the latest editor and publisher article, we talk about registration, first party data, and making every single user be addressable via advertising and transactional revenue. So really the mindset going forward is we need to think like B2B publishers, not consumer publishers. We need to know who all our users are. We need to be able to uh, segment our users and make them available to local businesses or, or advert, we call them advertisers. They're really marketing partners. Um, yeah. You know, what made us so great in 1.0, um, the period up to 2005 was um, we used our content to, there was a great value exchange. We created great content. And for that great content, we amassed this great audience. And we were able to create this marketplace. You know, in, 2000, in the second phase, we lost that marketplace advantage because of social, because of search, because of a, a lot of things. But, um, you know, this next phase is going to be both amazing and scary, but it depends how well you embrace the strategies and the technology, but it's not what we have today. I want to I want to go backward a little bit because something you said uh, struck me there, where you said we need to be B two B, and not B two C. Why? Why is that difference? Because you know all, all our careers, you know, and mine's only twenty five, thirty years, but uh, you know, all of our careers has been audience we go to that consumer to that who's buying our product that you know our news product but but you're kind of pointing to a shift there yeah so i don't mean that we need to be a b2b publisher we need to think like a b2b publisher you think like a b2b publisher b2b publisher knows every single person in their market if i'm a medical journal if i'm a you know a, a business journal i know everybody who's in my 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 data set my my audience set and in a lot of ways, I know everything about them. I know um, I know who they are. I enrich the data. I think right now um, the challenge that local media faces is first-party data means collecting an email address, you know, in the or a phone number in the B two B space. You get that email address and you enrich it. You know everything about their company. You know, you know, you know everything about that person. And we need to uh, enter into that sort of into that model how do we how do we do that how do we how do we get that kind of shift and start collecting those those things and building that that database i mean this is, as we all know data is is everything and you know you look at the um you look at uh the most valuable companies in the world amazon google facebook they're data companies they use our they use our um, our shopping information, our discussion information, our, uh, uh, our browsing information and put us into audience segments. And then they use that audience information to make us addressable 
by all their advertisers. So, you know, the tools that we need, I know um, Blocks Digital has some great uh, uh, first party data tools and audience segmentation tools. But I think, you know, we need to understand um, uh, um, customer data platforms, which is the you know, the, the heart and soul of what a, a B2B publisher uses. Um, and we just need to be a lot smarter about what we do with the data. Uh, we have so much information as local media publishers, the way people come in to, to our websites, um, use our social, use our emails. Um, you know, if we're able to track it and say, okay, this person was uh, looking at... Um, class uh, home ads, they're looking at neighborhood information, they're looking at school information, they're a young family, you know, or so now we can create these, these data segments to make them addressable to, um, to advertisers. Right, right. Well, I want to, I want to shift a little bit uh, our, our, our conversation, and I want to go to technology tools for producing the news. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, I think I think a lot of people, the, the, the three things you think of immediately, right, are mobile publishing, now video, right? We got to use more video. And 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 the scare, both the exciting and scary one, the topic of the day is AI. And and I think w w w are those the three are those the three things that really need to be talked about right now? Are we still focusing on mobile publishing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think a lot of people um, just because mobile is very expensive to do if you were trying to do it yourself you have vendors to work with um what people don't realize is the engage the engagement of a mobile user uh a, a a a mobile user it's not even close to uh what a web user is um i'll give you an example uh i ran uh mobile at um gatehouse which is now gannett and we had 312 um properties at the time and we able we were able to really dive deep into the the data associated with each so we found that um, a mobile native mobile user generates roughly 10 times more page views and ad views than a typical web user so really? with it, it i i guessed but i didn't believe until I saw the data. And it's, uh, it's 10x more than a um, mobile web user, and it's 20x more than a website user, because they are highly engaged, they come back, you know, 10 times more um, per month than a um, than a web user, and they stay a lot more. And I mean, think about your your personal be habits you're on your phone a lot more than you're on a website or a tablet right. we just need to really be able to monetize that embrace it um, when um, when i first worked on paid content one of the things that in fact i found the deck uh, for it i did uh, i worked on memphis commercial appeals um, pay model back in 2011 and i found the initial kickoff deck and it was called mobile publishing strategy and that's where we thought the the bulk of the the benefit would come from. When you say mobile publishing, mm -hmm. what are you really talking about that 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 news organizations need to be focused on? Because that means more than sure. I have a mobile app. It means more than somebody saved the shortcut to the website on their home screen, sure. right? Sure. When you are when you are talking about mobile publishing and being intentional, reaching your audience in that way where they are. What are what are you really talking about? What what tools and things are you talking about? Sure, uh, a mo a mobile app, uh, not a. So what's really interesting and great that you you brought that up. Um, a lot of publishers say we don't need a native mobile app. We have our native website. We have our our mobile web. That was the big right. argument back then. And if you look at what happened, and I'm sorry, I keep referring to the the period of two point um, 2.0 was spent on driving page views at any cost. And as a result, as a result, um, so I would argue sometimes even unprofitably, as a result, um, the industry depended high, heavily on search and social traffic. And 
mobile web captures all the search and mobile traffic. So you have the most, uh, the most, uh, I want to call it disloyal, but people who don't even know your brand, they just saw you on search or they saw you on a social post. They came to your site, they read the story and they're gone. And whether they come back again, they don't care because they followed that story. Um, that doesn't promote a lot of engagement or loyalty. Whereas somebody who took the time to download a mobile app, sometimes it's tied almost sometimes it's tied to your paid content strategy. You log in to your account and you're able to, to come back. And it's a convenience thing, right? If you think about a mobile app, a mobile app is a curation mm -hmm. tool. You're bringing in stories from around uh, your owned and operated original stories. You know, use it to create. Um, that was one of the strategies that we had at Gatehouse was we wanted to accelerate the velocity of the stream. So in other words, we wanted to post frequently. We wanted to po put ads in there that were um, expiring coupon ads or it, things that had a, we wanted to create FOMO, your fear of missing right. out. Right both through content and uh, advertising. But that's really, you know, the mindset that you need to have um, in a mobile app. It's not lift and shift and take what you had on your website. It's think about what the mobile user experience is. Think about why somebody has a phone. They want to be informed. They want to be updated. They want to find out where, you know, that Voodoo Donuts is having, uh, you know, uh, buy one bucket, get another bucket for Thanks. free. Thanks. Now, now I want donuts. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but that's really, you know, you want to cre create the fear of missing out in, in an accelerated stream. Right. You're talking, you're, you're talking about your build, actually building that relationship with, with your audience. And they have made a choice by downloading the app, by signing up. They've made a choice to, to be involved. Exactly. Exactly. What, um, let's, let's, let's go, go beyond that a little bit um, and then institute video like everybody's talking about we have to use more video you have to have video on your social feeds you have to have video on your app and your website I mean, that's how we're drawing people in right I, th I think um i think everybody's really attracted by video cpms against any other cpm video cpms are you know five ten times higher than uh display cpm so why wouldn't you but you know video video you need a strategy for video um, it's, um, you know, that, that's really a, a TBD and, and, and people are, just, are trying to figure that out right now. I, I know you want well, to talk about, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was gonna say, we, you know, when we had a, a few episodes ago, so to go, we, we were talking to, to, um, Kyle Rickoff about, about data. And, you know, one of the things he said is we're still figuring out how to track video. Well, like the, those stats aren't awesome yet. We're still trying to find how to track and what to track with video. Video analytics are horrible, especially if you get them natively out of the, there are a couple of, um, I'll call it video analytics companies that I'm working with. And um, as I sat through the initial demos, I was absolutely blown away that um, they had these metrics. Um, when we first started doing fast channels, um, we, that was one thing that we had to understand were the analytics, but I had a whole analytics team that was tagging everything that was, you know, we, we spent a lot of time and effort in understanding our analytics, but I don't know that a lot of folks that are doing video are really, um, you know, really leaning into the, the data. They're getting things that are out of the box or from the vendors, but you know, a lot of that is not uh, call it suboptimum. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think too, what we all are learning too is, is even knowing what to look for, like what, what pieces of that data are important to your goals is, is a hard place to even start with. That's, that's a, that's a fair point. Uh, engagement's critical. Uh, how long people are, well, when, when we build our, our video models, we look at two things really, uh, session length and, um, uh, number of sessions per month. Because from that, we can determine the total streaming hours, but we can also identify uh, how many monthly active users we need to power our data models. So those two things are absolutely critical, uh, bar none. Um, you know, I know you wanted to talk about fast channels, but yeah, what, 
one of the one of the things that's driving fast channels are fast channels as opposed to I'm going to load up a bunch of video on demand assets. A fast channel will drive more engagement, more ad views, more session and time spent than anything else. And we identified that in 2015 when we launched our our first channel at Calkins. And I spent three years evangelizing that, you know, a, a, a free ad supported streaming channel dwarfed anything that you could do with video on demand. But the challenge is it's hard. Even in 2023, it's hard. What did what did you see there? What did you see in engagement and traffic? Like what stood out to you that that this was? I mean, that's a whole separate effort and team, right? You can't just like you like you said earlier about you know website to to mobile app. You can't just shift the content and repurpose it. This sure. is this um, intentional different thing. So what were you looking at? We were looking at time spent. Um, so we looked at our and I mentioned session length and returns. Uh, on in a video on, on demand asset, we were seeing you know two minute engagement, three minute engagements. To watch a fast channel, and just so everybody uh, um, understands, fast channel is, sta fast stands for free ad supported streaming television. And if you think about it, it's a twenty four seven linear stream. It looks just like what you know today as television but you're watching it off of a streaming device, uh, a Roku Fire, Apple, even off your phone. So um, we created 24 seven channels from our TV stations and our newspapers. And we saw that the engagement metric um, time spent for our fast channel was an hour and 30 minutes. Every time somebody came, they stayed for an hour and 30 minutes. Wow. Versus, wow. versus three minutes for a VOD asset. Um, what we found that, uh, and this is for the broadcasters out there, broadcasters would um, stream their live news and then they would put a slate up, you know, which said we'll be back and they would show the, the time spent. So at the stations that we own that we did a live stream on a slate, we found that the average engagement time was 31 minutes, which is roughly the the length of time people spent. Right. But if we could create a 24 seven stream, they would come and they would watch it. And uh, it was, and, and if I can, if I can take a step back, why we figured sure. out that worked. Um, uh, so Calkins Media leaned into video in the early, uh, in, in 2013, we launched a, a newsroom. We were really committed to video. Um, a few months in, we realized that our engagement numbers were not growing. We, our audience wasn't growing and our time spent wasn't growing. So um, we went and we interviewed some folks that were um, really doing video well. I mean, excuse me, who were studying digital video at the time, including several PhDs and industry experts. And we asked who's making money in digital video. And their response was nobody. And huh. we said, surely there must be somebody making money in video. And they listed off, um, you know, several of the biggest YouTube creators. This is 2013. Uh, so it was the Young Turks and, and you know, some of the other ones that were really. So we said that, that that can't be. And the more we looked into it, we realized nobody was making money in video. Then we looked over at our, we uh, Calkins owned TV stations and newspapers. So we launched into video at our newspapers. So we looked over at our TV colleagues and we said how are you guys making money and we did we we broke down their data into a, a giant financial model and we realized it was all about engagement and time engagement and time spent and the only way that we could replicate it was by creating a 24 7 linear channel wow. used just by stacking video assets and that was kind of the the beginning of um you know the, the concept of of, of fast The News Nirvana podcast is made possible by the generosity of Blocks Digital. Blocks Digital empowers content producers to connect with their worldwide audiences at scale and continuously transform to achieve their business goals. Contact Blocks Digital today to learn more about how they can help you thrive. Connect with them at BlocksDigital.com.
and the numbers quickly backed up that that people were people were staying and they were consuming. The people were staying um at at the time we had uh I want to say 600,000 downloads of our um, TV station app. Um, and I think since we sold it, I heard the number went over 2 million. But wow. you, know, you, you, you had hundreds of thousands of uh, monthly active users. I mean, it our, our small local station dwarfed the national the, the nationals at the time. So that was, you know, just connecting some dots. You know, why is TV successful? Why is vod not successful well if we if we made if we could replicate that experience wow we could see similar success wow so if you look around now are there some some examples now in 2023 that you that you can point to that they're they're doing it i don't want i want to say can you you probably can't say do it right but doing well that are um, that are embracing that i think something that i and i haven't watched it yet so i but the Washington Post just announced last week that they launched the Fast Channel, and they're going to be on free V, which you know it makes sense. Jeff right. Bezos owns both, right? So, um, I, and I know of uh, at least one other major group that's uh, launched the Fast Channel, and several smaller groups. But um, you know, it's it's it takes planning. It takes um, you know it. it takes a lot of content and one of the things that i think newspapers uh and tv stations need to understand is you don't have to create all your original content you can be them you can be the audience aggregator you can be the destination and go aggregate and curate a lot of content um that exists in your in your community both from businesses and local creators and be the destination you don't need to be the creator and well, own, and, that, and own all the ad inventory. Yeah, it is is so so as you work with people to 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 strategize and make that plans. What are what kind of content and what kind of things are people are 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 we looking for to to fill these channels? Because I think it's easy to look at you know the post and and some of the yeah, exactly. bigger market TV stations. I mean, you know, the content that they generate on their own is is huge. But if you're a smaller organization and you're, you know, what kinds of content, how are you, how are you looking to fill that? Because, you know, when you first say 24 hours of content, that's a daunting task. It is a daunting task. Um, right now I'm working with a, a media company who is um, creating uh, both in, um, the, they're using their channel as an interstate and an intrastate marketing opportunity. So um, uh, think of it as I'm in, I'm in a market, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I don't know anything about the coast. I don't know anything about the mountains. I don't know anything about the Southern part of it. But each of those destinations want to market to the other destination to have people come to visit, right? So it's, 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 it's let's tell great stories about our city. Let's talk about um, and market it to the rest of the state and the rest of the country and the world you know so so telling those stories there's a lot of creators in each market there's a lot of vested interest in bringing people to the market things like that you know that's that that's in my opinion a, a really great use of a fast channel really great use of uh the the technology uh where i've seen it not do as well is um when a a, a, a local media company or a pure play tries to create tries to be the fifth news channel in a market. We don't need a fifth news channel in a market, right? We we have the four networks, you know, they they're they're limping along. You're not going to tell a different story, but be different, be original. Think think of the stories that aren't being told. Exactly. Think about the creators that there's some great content out there by YouTube creators and it's not the A list of creators who have you know, millions of subscribers. It's really, you know, the folks who have a couple hundred, couple thousand, they put just as much effort into their storytelling. You know, they, they create great pieces, but they just don't have the, 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 um, the audience or, or, or the venue to, to display. YouTube's a big place. Um, <laughs> are, are you talking, are you talking making partnerships with these, these creators? Absolutely. I, I think uh, media companies to need to really embrace the creator community. You know, you're a creator. This is a podcast, right? Um, 
there's you know great video creators there there's great audio creators out there i think um it 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 absolutely is uh a direction that uh local media needs to to really understand and embrace i uh, yeah that's a uh, and uh, that's that makes so much sense but i also feel like that's almost a a, a hard shift for our brains in the in the industry to like oh we need to go partner with those other creators those not news i mean we're a little snobbish right <laughs> in our in our world but but that's i mean it makes sense it's just it's a hard thing to get my brain to switch you know one of the things that was 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 great um i don't say great about covid but um the what what happened with um kind of how media transitioned during covid absolutely um you know you had uh weather and tv anchors doing doing broadcast from home you had mm -hmm. you know jimmy fallon and an american idol you know broadcast uh, finals broadcasting from home so i think the uh the the authenticity and uh versus high production quality that broadcast was used to really kind of leveled out during during the pandemic I, I think you are absolutely correct i think we learned that we can create content anywhere anytime but also even just like you know what i noticed is because the whole world started using video conference calls right so we got used to lower quality audio lower quality video so now if I if I have a guest on that doesn't have, you know, a great mic set up or whatever, right? It's fine. I used to futz about it, right? And really be concerned, but I think our our eyes and our ears got used to that and that, you know, good content can come from anywhere. I always say people don't want uh, drills, they want holes, right? People wanted the content. They didn't care how the content got made. And I think we're we're a lot more open to differences now you know there's not a a template or a boilerplate this needs to look like tv it it doesn't it needs to i don't want to say look more like youtube i i don't know well, well that's the next that's the next question so we talk about your you are either creating new content repurposing content partnering with people for for additional content when you build this channel this fast channel mm -hmm. does it look like tv does it look like high production value TV, or is it some does, some doesn't, but it's still good content? It's a great question. I think we're in this kind of evolutionary period where we're, we we love YouTube. I think YouTube is not even close. If you take everything that's on YouTube, it's not even close to the aggregation of everything else that's watched, <laughs> right. right? So this is now the norm. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's an evolution. I think uh, we're going to see creators get better. I wrote a piece in uh, uh, in editor and publisher about my take uh, my takeaway from um, NAB this year. And ten years when I uh, ten years ago when I attended NAB, it was one hundred percent catering to the broadcast industry. And when what you're seeing now is the equipment and software manufacturers realize that the creator community is much larger than the broadcast community. And they buy equipment more often. Broadcasters mm -hmm. buy things every 10 years. YouTube creators, a lot of them, you know, will go out and buy the, the latest and the greatest. So, so I, th I right. think there's going to be this huge transition. And uh, again, to, to shamelessly plug the article that I recently wrote, uh, in editor and publisher is um, the barriers to entry have are, are, are totally erased for a newspaper company, the high capital um, expense, the right. infrastructure, printing press, that's all gone. You don't need that anymore. You don't need an FCC license and you don't need a, you know, $2 million studio to be uh, the next version of the TV station in, in your, in your market. So, it's going to force media companies to move quicker, strategize faster, and not get stuck into their, uh, I want to call it their, their workflow, their legacy equipment, their legacy staffing. In order for media companies to go forward, you, you have to look at, have to think 
like not a media. I mean, you have to think like not a newspaper, not a TV station. You have to be nimble. You have to have a, a nimble tech stack and a nimble strategy. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think you're right about that. And and technology, um, you know, I when I first started out doing the the, the podcasting and, and production of stuff, I, you know, my rule was when I feel like I've earned it, when I've gotten good enough, I'll buy the next toy. I'll, I'll, I'll step up. But what's funny is, you know, I have, you know, whatever I've spent on all my cameras, all my mics, the best camera I own now is one of these. That's one of the highest quality cameras I've got. And I can take that and a couple lav mics and go out and produce. And you'll never it's, know the difference. It's be- your, your phone is better than a lot of TV equipment that existed five years ago. Exactly. Um, one, of the, one of my observations at NAB this year versus 10 years ago, or even five years ago, where um, you would see a lot of these journalists reporting from the field. You would see their lights set up. They would be standing in a corner. They And I saw technology. Uh, I, I, would, I would see these, um, these mobile journalists, these international mobile journalists, and they would have these tactical backpacks, this, these yes. things that look like phones, but they were like, they looked, I didn't know what they were. They were reporting from the field. They were picking up B-roll. They were they were streaming back, and somebody back home was was editing. It was it was mind blowing how the um, you know how how news gathering has changed. How reporting. I would see people walking through um, the show, talking to themselves, uh, talking to their phone, reporting on TikTok right. or Instagram, and it was you know it's game changing. Well, and I think that leads to uh, to me, and maybe this is this is one of the last things we kind we kind of hit here in our in our time is, oh okay, yes, technology moves fast. We have to embrace it. I think we can agree we're we're better at it. Uh, we're better at embracing it. We're better to, at finding the tools. But how do you balance the constant chase of what's new with using the tools to best achieve our our, our goals? Because our goal is mm-hmm. to produce the news to collect and produce the news for the people. How do you find that balance? Otherwise you're always chasing, you're always buying the next thing. That's a great question. Um, I'm actually right now, I kind of, I I don't say I backed into it, but at the request of a number of, of the folks I work with CEOs and publishers, you know, they ask me, um, will you, will you help us? Will you advise us on technology? Because at this point we don't even know what we don't know. So, and I, and the base of information and technology is so vast, but to your point about you, your job is creating news, I would argue that on the business side, the job is creating a, a revenue model, right? A, a sustainable revenue model. So um, I don't think you can look at what the great, latest and the greatest is. You need to figure out what's going to solve your problem. And you may even be a generation behind the latest and the greatest. I would say chase the latest and the greatest if it gives you efficiencies. That's a, you know, that's a strategic and tactical advantage. But you don't need the latest and greatest. But you don't need something that's five or ten years old that you're, right. you know, <laughs> keeping on life support and duct taping together so that you don't have to buy the latest. I think the advantage uh, you need to figure out, pick a point, figure out what problems you need to solve, and also plan for the future. Uh, I'm working with um, several broadcast groups right now, and their biggest challenge is uh, order management systems. Uh, they're using legacy order management. So I'm a big proponent of you need to be an omni-channel seller. You can't sell your core product and bolt on Google and Facebook and you know have to work through your you know submitting your billing. So there's a number of omni-channel order management systems that lets you work in, in one entire revenue workflow and everything happens on the back end. Those are not the latest and greatest, but that gives you incredible operating efficiencies, right? That's what you need to look for is operating efficiencies. How do you save money? How do you save time? How do you save mistakes? You know, that's really kind of the, the North Stars, solving your problem, but building for the future with an eye toward the future on the content and the revenue sides. Finding the tools. Finding the tools, embrace the tools and understand 
why you're doing it. But to to your point about you being a creator, you didn't buy the the mic and the setup and and have the uh, system that we're on because they were cool. It's because it saved you so much time and it brought your cost no, there was down. Thirty percent cool. Okay, it was part. <laughs> I mean, There's I always that. <laughs> I like shiny. You like shiny, but you're also practical, right? It, you're not yeah. going to. There's a lot of things out there right now that uh, you can go down a rabbit hole on. But, you know, as long as you're solving a problem and, and experiencing cost, you know, and time efficiencies, that's where you really need to focus right now. Right. Well, Guy, I, I appreciate you taking a little bit of time today and talking to us about, about technology and all the tools uh, that we can go. I know we kind of bounced a little bit, but also stayed. Uh, I love this show, but sometimes I wish we could have three hours and really <laughs> really get in. But uh, I, I wouldn't get the audience data uh, that you, you want <laughs> with a three-hour show. Um, but I, I, appreciate you, I appreciate you taking some time and talking with us today. Thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate it. And uh, happy to, you know, share with the industry any any questions you might have. Feel free well, to reach I, out to me. Well, and that leads me to my next thing. If people want to, you know, follow you on the socials or connect with you, how can they do that? Sure. Um, my website is tasakadigital.com. And um, I do, um, uh, and, and I, I call it uh, innovation coaching for media executives. It's really Kind of demystifying technology and putting together a plan uh both from a, a staffing level because that's one of the questions i get all the time how do i staff for the future how do i structure for the future uh and then also tech stacks but uh you follow me uh editor and publisher i have a monthly column and uh, you know feel free to reach me um through my website awesome awesome thank you guy i really appreciate it thanks a lot nick that'll wrap us up for this episode we'll talk to everybody next time The News Nirvana Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or most any of your favorite podcast apps. The News Nirvana Podcast is made possible by the generosity of Blocks Digital. Connect with them at blocksdigital.com. The News Nirvana Podcast is produced by Fredcasts. Think, speak, act. <laughs>